Hello everyone, it's 2.33 now, so we'll start. Welcome to session two of the Lee Kong Chien Natural History Museum's Thursday Talk Shop series, organized by the Outreach and Education Unit. So these talk shop sessions are casual sessions that we hope are educational and fun for all of you. And we've named them Talk Shop because we're going to talk about work with people we work or collaborate with after work. But well, because we're all mostly working from home now, right? So I guess technically we're still at work. My name is Ka, I manage the Outreach and Education Unit, and today my colleague uh, Tia Xuan, also from the Education Unit. Uh, Tia Xuan, you want to wait? Okay, so the both of us will be co-hosting today's session. So what's going to happen, for those of you who didn't join us uh, on during session one last week, is that we will be chatting with today's guest for around 30 minutes, and then we'll answer questions from everyone. So for those who tuned in last week, right, we're going to do things a bit differently today. So let me explain. We've disabled the chat box, but you will still be able to chat or send a message directly to the co-host. So if you have questions during the session today, please go to the chat box and send your questions directly to OU Staff 1 or OU Staff 2 as what you can see from the screen. So all the questions will be collated and then we will try to answer as much as we can. So feel free to send in your questions anytime during the session. Your questions can be about the topic or you can ask about the speaker or ask hosts more about our work as well. So if you realize you guys are all muted now and you don't have the option of unmuting yourself. So this is so that let's say there's any background noise wherever you're at, like an aeroplane flying past or a dog barking, it won't get picked up. So uh, let's get started. For those of you who don't know about the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum, and maybe this is your first activity with us, let me just quickly show you some very nice photos of the gallery. So some of you might have visited us uh, before, maybe many times. Uh, so this is the education team in action. So we have a very wonderful gallery. There's rural dinosaur fossils, there's the whale skeleton. We conduct gallery tours, uh, indoor and outdoor programs such as uh, talks, nature walks, camps, and many more. So I'm going to start today's session straight. Today's guest is someone we work with a lot, but she isn't museum staff. So her name is Dr. Theresa Su, and she's the Education Manager at St. John's Island National Marine Lab. So we'll leave her to talk more about her background and what she does. So besides the fact that our organizations have uh, very long names, right, we also have a lot of <laughs> work commonalities also. So today we'll be talking about some of the collaborative research and education programs that the museum and SGI NML have worked on together and how important such collaborations are for conservation issues. Also, since we are educators, right, we're also going to be chatting about how effective communication helps bridge the gap between researchers and members of the public, be it in natural history or in marine science. So I'll get Jia Xuan to get the chat started. Okay, so hi everyone, and also hi to Teresa. So Teresa, would you like to start off by telling everyone more about your background and how you started working at the St. John's Island National Marine Lab? Hello everyone, my name is Teresa. I'm the Education Manager at the St. John's Island National Marine Laboratory. For those of you who are not familiar, St. John's Island is one of the islands down south and it's approximately 30 minutes by ferry from mainland Singapore. So this is where we are at. The St. John's Island National Marine Lab is the first and only offshore marine station in Singapore and since 2016, uh, we have been designated as the National Research Infrastructure and we are funded by the National Research Foundation. So one of the more common questions when visitors pop by, they would ask me, uh, so how do, you, how do you find this job? How do you, what's your background? How do you land a job at the marine station? So here's a bit about me. Uh, I guess I was unknowingly immersed in the natural environment since young. I actually lived in a kampong for a bit and I grew up helping out at my dad's uh, florist shop after school and I also had the opportunity to have a small florist shop for a bit uh, before I entered uni. So I sort of didn't do the usual part-time jobs like my peers. And during my undergrad days, uh, I had two separate uh, research experiences. So one was for my Europe's uh, which is the Undergraduate Research Opportunities in Science, uh, which I was set or tasked to find out a bit more about the fauna of Kent Ridge that's on campus. Then uh, I quickly realized that terrestrial work a bit too tough for me. Uh. Uh, so for my final year project, I was tasked to work in the mangoes and I looked at the diets of uh, mudskippers. Yeah. 
And I quickly learned to like mangrove work quite a bit. And I was very fascinated by the model organism that I was studying, which is the mudskippers. They're quite interesting. They have very uh, special behavior, like the males look after the young. And they also look like uh, they are stuck in this evolutionary phase where uh, they're trying to come out of water onto land. So from these two experiences, uh, it, I found out uh, very quickly that the more I know, the more I don't. So I quickly went on to grad studies where I expanded on the dietary work of mudskippers. Then I also started to look at their prey, which tend to be very small crabs in the mango. So these are the carnivorous uh, mudskippers and, and these are the small crabs that they feed on. And just how small maybe you can see from this uh, short clip. Yeah, so these are the mangrove uh, breathing roots and that's how small the crab is uh, within the mangrove breathing roots. Yep. Yeah, so in my free time, I also volunteer with the museum at exhibits like this one. This is the Festival of Biodiversity and this is how I'm also very familiar with the friends at the museum. Yep. Okay, so could you also briefly describe to us your daily work life as an educator at the Marine Station? Yeah, so I really enjoy what I'm doing currently. Uh, I like to learn a bit more about marine science. I like to share with people about what I've learned. And I'm glad, to do, I, I, I'm glad I get to do it as a job. At the St. John's Island National Marine Lab, when we receive requests uh, to conduct workshops or programs, one of the first things to do is to understand what the participants want to know. And the crowd is quite varied, like you can see here. Here are the preschoolers, then we have the primary school and the uh, secondary school students. And we also have uh, aspiring marine scientists. So here we have the postgraduate students from the University of Malaysia, Trenggano. And some of them are studying to be aquaculture specialists or taxonomists. So after finding out what they are requesting for, I will then work with colleagues like fellow educators. Uh, this is Priscilla. Priscilla is our outreach officer at SGI. And I will also work with resident scientists to see how we can facilitate the information transfer. So this is Dr. Yani Tanzil. She is the senior research fellow, coral expert at the SJI NML. Okay, so speaking of research, right, I do know that our organizations, which is the Natural History Museum and the Marine Station, collaborate together quite a bit. So not just in the outreach and education side, right, which is like our territory. So <laughs> we do collaborate quite often in the research work as well. And of course, when you have two of our organizations being roped in together, the nature of our collaborative research projects tend to gravitate towards marine biodiversity, right? Mm. So one of the more interesting and prominent projects that um, I can recall would definitely be this one. So this is the South Java Deep Sea Expedition. So this expedition is a 14-day expedition uh, that happened in 2018 at the southern coast of West Java. So, actually, we also have uh, one of our colleagues who went on this trip, tuning into this session. So, his name is Zaki, and he works at a specialist associate at the Natural History Museum. So, maybe Jai can unmute uh, Zaki so that he can share his experience. Okay, so Zaki, what was the expedition about? Hi. Uh, so, for this expedition, right, we had a research team uh, that comprised of NUS researchers. That included uh, our museum staff as well as the colleagues from TMSI. And there were also Indonesian scientists as well from DP. So this collaboration was not only uh, uh, that, but also a collaboration between two countries. So the aim of this expedition was to study the deep sea marine life at this area, which historically has been partially unexplored, but has a lot of potential for interesting or new findings, uh, as you can see on the screen. So, uh, maybe we shift to the next slide. So, Zaki, why are you probably holding the isopod? <laughs> Does this have anything to do with the fact that you like Star Wars? And, like, you realize it's the Lion King scene, right? That's right. <laughs> the Simba. So, it's like a proud dad lifting the newborn. But in this case, it's the isopod. Please explain. So, I, I think the pose was, was just quite um, natural, like, because. Um, I mean, we had we had uh, a lot of work on the ship, so it just came naturally like, because that, that thing was so huge, right? And then the moment that we get we got it on, on board from the troll, and everybody was just so literally wowed by the size of it, mm. like it's like this really the size of a newborn baby, and like because steel work is really really hard work, 
it's mm. physically tiring and mentally draining sometimes. So when when something like this appears, you can't just stop, but you know, like raise it up and like yeah, <laughs> like this is what this is what we got, <laughs> you know. Cool. So, right, uh, we have a video from the trip provided by Ifa, who is also one of our colleagues. So, it's a snippet of some of the things that happened. So, maybe Zaki, you want to just explain what's happening? Okay, so this is a fast video. So, now this is like a aerial, like a drone footage of the ship that one of us, uh, Dr. Tan, he brought a, a drone over so that we can uh, do shots like this. So, this is the back area, the working area of the ship where we do all most of the work, basically. Um, so this is a beam trawl. The, we use it to trawl the, the depth of the ocean and go up to like I think 1.5 kilometers down. So this is a net as, that's attached to the end of the trawl. So we are uh, bringing mm. it up, we're covering the trawl, and we are now like emptying the, the net into the this plastic bu uh, buckets that we use. So now this process is just sifting through all the mud and all the debris in the in the in the net. So that's the a metal sieve. So once we see the stuff out we sort the specimens out on these plastic trays. So that's by groups and by families. So you can see that every night we have like a very nice sunset. Then and we were we were lucky enough to see like live dolphins that shaking close to our boat at night during one of the nights. So. Hmm. Yeah so that's basically it. Uh. <laughs> so like what are some of your experiences or takeaways from the trip? Something interesting is that uh, your background is not in science, it's in arts. So does that make your experience and learning during the trip any different? I think one of the it just described my experience. Uh, like in the first week I was there, right? It was really like hell because we were very seasick. And we were still fine-tuning our SOP, like what to do on the ship when, when the troll comes. So sometimes I kind of felt like I wasn't like I didn't fit in a bit. So I didn't know what to do at first, but eventually like you know, it's your first sea expedition. So after the after a while, you get used to it. You get used to the rhythm of everything. So it's all good, right? And the sea is really quite beautiful. Right? You can see in the pictures there. Um, you get like beautiful sunsets and sunrises every day, and like colossal clouds like looming in the distance. And sometimes mm. there's like not even land in sight. So you're just stuck with like, oh, how big and beautiful the world is. Right? But despite all this, um, just want to point out that. You know, like there's a lot of marine trash, like in the ocean, and it happens a lot. Like in some places that we just kept trawling marine trash over and over again, so it was a bit unbearable and and sad at the same time because a lot of the trash were disposable products and packaging like from instant noodles. But on a brighter note, like I had the first experience, first time experience, to witness all these strange and wonderful animals that we got, which I had a fun time sketching during my free time. Like my new sketching and drawing on a boat is another challenge in itself. Like we have. Get like seasickness and like things are just rolling all over the place. So can you you can imagine like trying to draw what you see? Mm. And I had this also a bit, uh, an opportunity to draw like illustrate how the troll works just for the for the local media. So that's quite cool as well. That's very interesting. So important question: How seasick were you? <laughs> 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 this is oh my god. Okay, you have no idea because. Like in the evening we set sail, right? Like everyone was so excited and feeling so good. We were like so pumped and excited. But the next gig, the next gig came and I, I was one of the first few to have breakfast uh, in the ship. And then there were, I think there were like only two or three people in the mess, which is the dining area. And then it turns out like, if I remember correctly, like about half the research team, like were too seasick to even get out of, out of their rooms. Right? So basically they were all still inside the room, still in bed, like they can't even like function. And, but fortunately, we, we, we all took this seasick pills and like, which, which really worked lah, but it still took like two or three days to get accustomed to the seasickness. And then like, there was one morning I woke up and I was thinking like, I've been taking the pills for like one week already. So maybe I don't need to use it anymore. But wow, that was like a super bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> So from morning to like lunch, I couldn't like, I was just, I just kept vomiting and feeling nauseous at the same time. So yeah, I was just like out loud, but you know, like the first day to the last day, there was like three weeks, we just had to keep eating the pill. If not, we would just get sick every day. Oh my god, that sounds... That's it. Okay, thank you Lucky for that personal experience about your, uh, during Sejanis. So Zaki has to rush off now, uh, and we're going to get back to talking shop with Teresa. But unfortunately, Teresa has lost connection because apparently where she lives, there's um, 
uh, lightning a bit. <laughs> we are gonna get Priscilla to help. So Priscilla is actually her colleague. Uh, <laughs> this is so important to but okay, you can. Okay, um, maybe Tiata can continue uh, asking Priscilla some of the questions that we post to Teresa. She'll join us when she can. Okay, so before that, Oh, okay, I think Teresa is back. Okay, so okay. before that, uh, here are some photos from the deep sea expedition. So uh, the top two photos, right, these are actually clearer photos of the giant marine isopod. So you can see from this one over here, right, the face really looks like Darth Vader from Star Wars. So uh, this was also the first time that we knew that such creatures could actually be found in the Indonesian sea as well. Uh, to you, right, this may look very creepy uh, and very ugly, but actually to my colleagues, this is very cute. My boss even calls it adorable, okay? So, um, yeah, it's uh, to each his own. <laughs> so at the bottom, we have a cock eye squid. This, uh, as the name suggests, right, one eye is larger than the other. At the bottom, right, this is a fang tooth fish. So um, it has wicked like fang-like teeth so that it can grasp onto its prey. So these are just some of the creatures that we found during the deep sea expedition. So um, Teresa, maybe you would like to add on. Um, so I think some questions some of you might be thinking right now is like, why do deep sea creatures look so weird and uh, not so ordinary? So Teresa, would you like to add on on that? Yeah, so uh, for me, it's like one of the first few questions is why they look so bizarre and um, what, how do they even withstand the kind of pressure? So for, from what I know is that deep sea environment has very little to low light penetration, so it's very, very dark. So these uh, animals tend to be very dull or draped as there is little use for bright or very attractive coloration uh, to camouflage or attract mates. So... Um, as compared to, uh, as, for, as for the pressure, right? So if you look at organisms that are around the sea level, we are exposed to what is known as the one atmospheric pressure. But if uh, divers here would know that at every 10 meters depth, uh, the pressure increases by one atmospheric pressure. So let's say these organisms are found at, say, 3,000 meters. What they'll be experiencing is something like 300 times the amount of pressure. So the question is, what kind of structure support will then these animals need to withstand uh, for that kind of environment? I think these are very uh, amazing uh, creatures and some of these questions really need to be answered by these expeditions, yeah. Mm, so I think objectively speaking, it's not that they are super ugly, it's just that we are not very used to their appearances. Yeah, right. Because like what Teresa said, uh, in the deep sea environment, the pressure is extremely high, the temperatures are also low, and it's pitch dark. So uh, these are very unique challenges that we don't experience as terrestrial beings. So a lot of times their appearances are actually as a result of adaptations to all these kinds of conditions. Okay, so moving on, uh, Teresa, I heard that one of the big happenings this year that happened at the marine station would be the conclusion of another expedition, am I right? Yeah, that's right. Mm, so uh, at the marine station, we had a team of seven researchers uh, uh, embark on this expedition to the clarion Clipperton Fracture Zone, CCFZ in short, and that's in the, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. So this is part of the CAPL and the National University of Singapore Corporate Laboratory. It's a 37-day trip to the area between February and March. So they sort of just came back before the circuit breaker. And this is part of an environmental survey. Uh, it's organized by the CAFO Corporation Ocean Mineral Singapore. So they look at the collection of what we call polymetallic nodules from the seabed. So these are uh, nodules that contain commercially very valuable metals such as copper, nickel, or manganese. Uh, and these nodules would then provide um, hard surfaces or substrate for uh, these what we call encrusting organisms uh, such as sponges to grow on. And they will then be able to colonize an otherwise uh, muddy environment. Uh, some of the mobile organisms that are on the nodules as well include things like bristle worms or isopods. So from this expedition, I understand that uh, more than uh, hundreds of deep sea creatures were documented, of which a lot of them are new to science. So with the help of uh, some very powerful microscopes on board, here are some of the photos that the deep sea team has compiled. Uh, this is a uh, a figure or a compilation of photos of the more leggy friends, the copepods, the amphipods, and the isopods uh, from the box core samples. So they are crustaceans, and the crustaceans that we are more familiar 
uh, two would probably be the prawns and the crabs. Yeah. And here we have the foraminiferans. Uh, forams in short, they are single cell organisms. So, uh, and they come in all shapes and sizes, just one cell. And they have an amazing diversity where they are found in the mud samples. And we also have all kinds of mollusks in the sample, including uh, these. These are some of, most of them are like bivalves or gastropods. So uh, mainly snails or clams as we know them commonly. And the team just came back and we are, we are at, the, at the marine station, we're definitely excited to find out a lot more from them when we reopen after mm -hmm. circuit breaker lifts. Okay, um, so the scientific work at both our organizations, right, typically involve quite a bit of like organization to organization or like country to country collaborations. So there must be a lot of reasons or benefits as to having such a partnership. So Teresa, can you tell us why, uh, why does the SGI NML work so closely with researchers from all over the world? Yeah, so from what I understand, once upon a time, scientists tend to be a bit like Kung Fu masters, a bit more guarded with their research. Uh, but these days, I think the way forward really is to pool the expertise as well as the resources. So as with expeditions like this, the manpower required is quite a bit and the amount of money to send the team over is also quite a bit as well. So uh, with, with this pooled knowledge and expertise, right, we can then uh, quickly establish what is baseline, uh, what is the common knowledge or information, we can share them readily, and then building upon this knowledge, we can then push scientific frontiers. Yeah. Okay, so we've been talking quite a bit about expeditions that happened overseas, right? So maybe I'll just share a little on an expedition that happened locally last year. So... This one is the Singapore Marine Fishers Expedition. So the purpose of this expedition was to build up a fish inventory uh, or a DNA database for species of fishes that can be found in Singapore. So this project uh, was co-led by Dr. Zihan, who is a lecturer uh, from NUS, and also Professor Henning Seedorf from the Thermasic Life Sciences Lab. So this expedition lasted for 12 days. Uh, there were about seven international scientists joining a team of more than 50 local scientists, staff, interns, and volunteers, which includes myself, uh, Ja, and some of my colleagues at the Natural History Museum, as well as some volunteers from the St. John site. So um, in total, right, we uh, collected more than, uh, we collected, I mean, we, we actually had about 300 species of fishes being barcoded and added to the database. And uh, that's actually a lot. And the good news is the fish library is still in the works and it will soon actually be accessible to the public. So this will probably happen sometime next year, in year 2021. Yeah, so like we're talking about local and international expeditions, right? But many people do question whether these expeditions and research are necessary. Like, are we damaging the environment? Do we have to keep and preserve the organ organisms? What do you think, Teresa? Um, yeah, so damage to the environment is definitely one of the main concerns when conducting field sampling or survey. So I think having trained workers to conduct such expeditions to ensure uh, the impact is limited or minimized is very, very important. So also like in the case of the recently concluded deep sea expedition, uh, we know very little about this habitat or the ecology of the place even. So with the scientists on board, the team can then characterize what is known about the environment, uh, then catalog what the community living there is like. And with proper documenting, collection can then be conducted in a more sensitive manner with mm -hmm. uh, minimal disruption to the habitat. Yeah. yeah. So like, like what you said, we can't deny that there's damage inflicted. We're not really, uh, we're not defending it, but we're explaining it, like to quote the boss of the museum. So you cannot conserve what you don't know. There's always going to be an inevitable trade-off. Like many times, right, pictures or specimens alone are not enough to identify and, un and understand the biology of the species. So detailed observation and studies using lab equipment and DNA processing are needed. So like well-preserved specimens, right, like the one that we see in the museum gallery, they can last for decades. And it's also important for like members of the public to come to take a look at it because some of these things are like um, organisms that you would probably never encounter in your lifetime. So all these findings from research projects are important in guiding decisions and policies, such as in this case, possible deep sea environmental impact assessments, especially since small countries like Singapore and um, are, uh, are planning to venture into the deep sea to mine minerals. 
Mm, so, uh, also our organizations do conduct a lot of cool research, but there's also a need for us to put it out there to the public and also communicate our findings to them. So that's where our respective uh, outreach and education units come into play. So maybe Teresa, you would like to share with us some of your experiences or challenges in communicating scientific findings to the public. Uh, so for me, I really do agree that communication is very important. Uh, research shouldn't be done just for the sake of research. So I really enjoy going out to the field, collecting data and, you know, experiencing nature. Uh, and as you may know, I studied the diet of mud skippers. Then my question to myself is, uh, if I do not communicate the science, then I feel that I'm not doing justice to the fishes that I use in the experiment or even the crabs. So then when I share about the research, whether it's from my work or from other researchers or scientists, when I see that the excitement uh, for the environment or for the animals, the sense of fulfillment is really unparalleled. Then uh, as for challenges, I think that there is technical vocabulary used by all scientists to convey uh, in a concise and precise manner. But the language used may not be appreciated by the general public. Uh, so because of my research background, sometimes I tend to speak in such terms that can be a bit too technical. So like maybe an analogy will be like, English is my preferred language. And when I have to guide or teach in Chinese, I revert back to English sometimes to express myself. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to work on it. Yeah. Mm, I think the challenge that Teresa faced is also the same challenge that all of us at the education unit of the museum face as well. So for us, we do conduct a lot of indoor and outdoor um, programs, such as gallery tours, workshops, camps, uh, outdoor camps, for example. Uh, and we do it for people of different age groups as well. But we do also recognize that not everyone has like an interest in biodiversity in the first place or uh, not everyone has background knowledge on it. So the challenge is to really package the same information in many different ways to suit our audience. So for example, we do get a lot of preschoolers and when we have preschoolers, we tend to tone down on the technical terms and we try to make a lot of like reference to popular media like movies. So um, like Disney and Pixar movies that feature animals, right, are kind of like our best friends. We make a lot of reference to it. Okay, so uh, for schools as well, we also try to like uh, cater to the syllabus that they learn in the MOE syllabus. So this also brings us to the part where we collaborate with Teresa and her team on many outreach and education programs. So maybe Teresa, you want to add on on that? Yeah, so um Priscilla, who is also in the crowd today. Yeah, we, we do work with the museum friends quite a bit on a very regular basis to conduct programs for schools and public. So one of the main programs that we do collaborate on is the Marine Conservation Program. And this is funded by the Jubilee Whale Fund. Uh, in 2015, a sperm whale was washed up onto our shore. And some of the first few questions that came up were things like, oh, you mean we have whales in our water? Or what else do we have in our water? Where should we go to see them? Kind of stuff. So the Marine Conservation Program was then proposed where the education team at both uh, the museum as well as at the Marine Station worked together uh, to come up with the programs that are suitable to the public or to schools. So we have uh, the annual Marine Open House at the museum. We have guided walks at St. John's as well as other marine habitats. Uh, if I'm not wrong, the uh, museum does it at Pasiris Park, mm. right? Yeah. And as well as the hands-on workshop at St. John's to understand a bit more about the local marine science research. Hmm. And so on a good day, if you do join us at St. John's for our walk, uh, here are some of the things that you can see. Up left hand corner, we have a, a pistol shrimp. Then we have a intertidal sponge that is right next to it on the right. Then uh, top left hand corner is a bit faint here, but there is a couple fish right in the middle of the photo. Then bottom left, we have a crab, some sea stars and a polychaete worm. So, and next, we also do have, uh, yeah, so some of the organisms, you may not be able to see them, but you can see traces of them. Like this is a mud lobster mound. And then we have a heron next to it. Uh, third photo from the left, that's a white-bellied sea eagle's nest. The white-bellied sea eagle is right in the middle of it. It's just very small, you can't see. And this great, huge nipa palm on St. John's Island as well. Yeah. And for things that will require a bit more assistance, this is, the, this is actually seawater from our flow-through system. This is the amount of organisms we have in there. 
Then top left hand corner, we have an octopus trying to aerate its burrow. That's some signs of it from the burrow. And we also do have pygmy squids. So these squids are very small, about uh, 2 to 3 cm. And from here, you can probably see how it's trying to change its color to camouflage itself from me. Yeah, so that's very, very small in the water. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, another big program that we do collaborate on with the museum people, that's the STEP Environment Camp. These are for JC students uh, from all over Asia, uh, joined by our own local, J sorry, youth from 19 to about uh, 17 to 19 uh, from Asia and joined by our JC students. And they do come together for one week camp to learn more about the environment, conduct some uh, research as well as present about what they have learned in Singapore. Then they go back to their respective countries to share a bit more about that. Yeah, and this is funded by the Temasek Foundation. Mm. So maybe before we end off, right, uh, I just want to ask you, I think you touched on this at the start, it's very interesting that you've done research, you've completed your PhD, but you didn't choose the academia path. Of course, there's no like one more fits all, la. like everyone's different, but what's the reason that you decided to um, like work on education and research instead of continuing research? I mean education and outreach instead of continuing your research. <laughs> I think I briefly shared that I was volunteering with the museum on the side <laughs> when I was doing research. Mm. Uh, this is especially so when I'm very stressed at work. <laughs> yeah, so the more stressed I am, the more things I volunteer for. <laughs> and when I share about something interesting to me, when I find that the other person or the other party I'm chatting to share the same fascination, mm. it really fuels me and uh, to want to find out a bit more. So when I was doing research, I always get distracted by other people's work as well. <laughs> I'll go and kipo, check them, find out more, volunteer as few help. And mm. at my current job, I really get to do both of that. So I talk to the researchers, find out a bit more what they're doing, um, and also design programs with Priscilla to showcase their work in possibly a more bite-sized or easy-to-consume form. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's the same for us also. Like we have the researchers around us, so we like uh, we learn from them, we get information from them, and put it out to the members of the public. And there's this sense of satisfaction gain. Like after a program that's done, when someone who doesn't have any interest in biodiversity, right? After that, they come and tell you that, oh, I'm very interested to maybe do some nature guiding or like I want to go spot birds now at their own free time. So it's very gratifying. It's like this sense of like achievement, even though it's something small, but it's very satisfying. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yes. We hope that everyone's enjoyed themselves and thank you so much, Elisa, for agreeing to talk to me and the whole team for session two. Uh, we hope you had fun. I mean, we usually talk, but this time we have like 200 people listening to us talk. Yes. Yeah, thank you for having me. And <laughs> um, like the, we talked about the Marine Conservation Program, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's on hold now, but when, yes. when it reopens, we are more than happy to uh, guide some of you or like have workshops for some of you guys yeah mm, okay so hopefully everybody everything returns to normal soon and then we can get doing our education programs again yeah that's right mm. so next week session three is our last session and this time we're going to cross borders okay so, <laughs> we are, <laughs> so we're going to call someone who is not from singapore Right, so uh, he's going to talk to us about plastic pollution. So I'm just going to leave it uh, like that. And if you want to know more, right, uh, please look out for our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we'll have information on the sign-up links thereafter. Okay, we'll just leave this page on now so that you guys can quickly do the feedback for us. And we hope to see you next Thursday as well, same time.